And I love hearing how some of the world's best companies and Figma customers approach shipping products. And that's why I'm so excited to hear from our next speaker and Figma user, Steve Johnson, who is the VP of design at Netflix. He's also a board director of Zendesk. And one of the things he champions is getting more designers on boards and getting more designers involved and engaged in business outcomes at every level of the organization so that they can challenge the status quo and bridge the gap that often exists between design and business. We are very lucky to have Steve speak to the Figma team for an internal fireside chat a couple of years ago. And we're so inspired, we knew we had to bring him to Config. So I'm excited for all of you to hear from him too. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Hi, everybody. I don't think I was expecting that reaction. Hi, Jen. I'm Steve Johnson. Um, I'm here from Netflix. Uh, thank you very much for having me. My talk is going to be called Design Without Business is Decoration. And uh, when I very first put this out there, I started getting all these social media comments, a lot of which I wasn't expecting. Um, lots of things from what do you mean, why do you mean it, that kind of thing. But the one that stood out the most was this. It was, uh, why are you going all product manager on us? And, and, and what bothered me about that was is that this actually is the problem. And this is the reason that I want to set up this talk. All of us are business people who speak through our discipline. So I'm a business person that speaks through design, just like PM, speak through PM, engineering, etc. So what I want to do now was this. I'm going to have the talk in two sections. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history on like how I got this development or where I came to be with this you know, process, and then some advice. So we're going to take it way back. We're going to go back to the 70s, all right? We're going to go way, way, way back. Early car design in the 1970s um, in general was very much about decoration. It wasn't about the function. It was really just about the form. How does it look? Not necessarily how does it perform. And a lot of these things were decorations all over the vehicles to make it look fast, make it look futuristic the whole bit. But in a lot of cases, it actually sewed the cars down. When you think about even home automation back in the late 60s and 70s, it was very similar. It was super clunky. It didn't necessarily work right. There were all these things that were supposed to bring us more innovation, but they actually didn't work that well, but they looked very futuristic. I can't diss on 70s music at all because I still listen to it, but I can definitely talk about the fashion. And 70s fashion, though very fashionable, the materials that were used weren't very good. The polyester should have never been invented, especially for people to be wearing back in like the heat. Thick cottons, that kind of thing. So once again, it looked great, but it didn't feel great. So that was something that always resonated with me as I was thinking about, well, how did design evolve? How did what we do evolve? So then we go to the 80s. And the thing about the 1980s that was fantastic was it really was supposed to be an indictment on the 70s. It was supposed to really kind of make it way more vibrant, way more fun. And something really big happened in the 80s, which was the rise of consumerism, right? So, you had these mega shopping malls. You had products and services all over the planet that everybody wanted to buy. And then that's when designers really started focusing in on how do you make this thing look great. But that convergence between it working well and it, and it feeling right still wasn't quite there. Again, uh, I'm a car person, so I'm always going to have some kind of car video. Even with car design, 80s vehicles looked fantastic. They looked really fast. They looked like they could do all these things but they actually weren't very efficient. They weren't good vehicles. 
With the exception of the Mac, you know, Macintosh that came out late 80s, even computer companies were really struggling to bring together design and the technology and the business. They had these very low business margins. They didn't have a lot of ergonomic design and the technology really wasn't quite there. My last one is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about 80s clothing. I still tend to wear some of it, but it was just horrible, right? I mean, it's like you had zippers that went nowhere. You had extra fabric for no reason whatsoever. You know, I mean, everything was just kind of excessive. You had spandex, right? And again, the look was fantastic. It defined an era, but it didn't feel right. The reason I'm bringing these things up for those earlier decades is that got me thinking, lack of value can cheapen the perception of design. If you don't find a way to help make sure that what you're designing actually has value, then all the things that you're doing really do just tend to seem like decoration. And in some cases, there could be a backlash to this. You stop trusting things that look really good. I remember I used to go shopping for things. I'm like, this looks fantastic. My mom's like, no, it won't hold up. And in a lot of cases, she was right. Okay, we're gonna continue the journey. So now we're gonna talk about the 90s. Something big happened to me in the 90s. It was monumental. It changed my entire worldview, my whole life. And it wasn't blockbuster video. It was the iMac. I remember when this commercial very first came out, the thing that really stuck with me was how interesting it was that they showed the back of a PC being beige, tall, cluttered. It was large, it had all these wires the whole bit. And then it went to this incredibly clean design. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this. If you talk to people at Apple, they'll talk to you about this being the savior of the company. It's when Steve came back after he was ousted he brought a young designer, 29-year-old Johnny Ives with him at that time, and they brought together design and business and technology. They said, we need to build something that's gonna revolutionize the world, it's gonna have a fantastic design, it's gonna be accessible, and it's gonna save the company. And I mean, the results speak for themselves, right? 800,000 units in the first quarter. 50% first-time computer users. And the reason why that should be important to all of us is the design of this computer introduced 50% more people into having a personal computer that it never had one before. They raised their market share from three to 5%. They took the company from negative 878 million to being profitable. All of this is really important when thinking about what we do for a living. So I've always had this old school design process. Anyone that's ever worked with me knows, I, you know, um, knows about this. I'd say it all the time. Who's it for? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? Where will people use it? When will people use it? And why will they love it? It's the sixth one that I started concentrating on a lot more as I started developing this idea around design without business is decoration, which is how does it contribute to our business? So I'm just gonna give you all just five things that I think about whenever I'm doing, a, whenever I'm about to approach a whole new design, and then I'll get out of your face so we can all get to our next event. Here's the first one. I always try to make sure we're designing for business opportunities, not engineering constraints. This is huge. My entire career it was like, well, here's what the engineering team can't do, or here's what we can't do. So we have to make sure we design around that. It wasn't until I started changing that to, well, wait a minute, what's our business goal? What is it that we want to achieve as a company? And then as long as we're aligned to that, we can then inspire our engineering counterparts to maybe meet that moment. The second one is understand your earnings, um, your um, earnings report and financial goals. I recognize this really only works well if you have a publicly held company, but even if you're a privately held company, you should have financial goals and you should know what they are. The reason I'm big on this is because this is like having the answers to the test. When I go through the earnings report of my current company, I know exactly what we said we were going to do what we said that we need to do, and what we're saying is important. And this always helps when you're prioritizing your work. So if you have a feature or product that you're really into, you know instantly what the prioritization is based on the earnings. The third one is know your board. And I didn't realize how important this was until I was on one. This is the group of people 
that are influencing your CEO and your C-suite. So if you don't know what they value, then you have no idea who's influencing the CEO or the C-suite. You should definitely understand them. It doesn't mean that you have to go meet them or et cetera. It just means take five minutes, figure out who they are, and then understand more about what they value. The fourth one is know your competitor's business goals. Very similar to knowing your own goals, you should know what your competitor's goals are. Again, it's the keys, right? I mean, it's the answer to the test. So when we're designing at Netflix, we almost always understand what's going on with all of our competitors because we just read their earnings report. And by better understanding their goals, then we understand what they value and then where we're going to be able to either intercept, bypass, or ignore. Here's the last one. Always try to be accountable. Like, try to make sure that your designs are accountable to a business outcome. I don't care if you're using OKRs, goals, whatever. Whatever your system is, you should make sure that it harkens back to what those business goals are, and then you're 100% accountable um, to them in order to make sure that you're aligned. Okay, before I jump, a question I always get, I get what am I watching on Netflix and um, do I know Jenna Ortega? And then the last question that I normally get though is, is there a company that I admire that really kind of brings all these together? And there is, um, and I hope they don't mind me showing some of their work. This is Esper Bionic. They are currently doing what I believe is exceptional work, and they're bringing together design, business, and technology. ZDNet recently wrote this article about them that I was like, yes, it's almost like they're reading my mind. This AI-powered prosthetic hand is bringing design and style to a life-changing product. Esper Bionic is elevating both the science and design of prosthetics while turning it into a lifestyle category. I never thought somebody would call a bionics company a lifestyle category, but it's 100% that, and it's because they're aligning these things. So here's what I want to leave all of you with. When design technology and business align, you can change people's lives. It doesn't matter what product or service you're working on. It doesn't matter what company you work for or what you're doing. When those things come together, it will be life-changing. And that's when you'll be able to build the types of products and services that people will absolutely love. And that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Steve. I love Steve's provocation think, to think about how we show up, stretch beyond the labels of our role, and become advocates for our organization and our users. And what Steve reminds us is that we're all here to keep evolving and keep learning, because at the end of the day, we're forever students of our craft and students of life. Which brings us to one last special group of people I want to talk about, students. As Dylan mentioned this morning, we believe providing early access and inspiration to students is critical to their future success. And it's because of this that Figma is and will always be free for students and educators. And that's why, thank you, we have an extended partnership with Google Chromebooks that you heard about earlier, which brings Figma to more schools, extends the programs to kids under 13, and also expands with Chromebooks into Japan. So, to celebrate this, we want to close out the morning sessions with the story of Mr. Curran's class at Los Osos Middle School, a public school in San Luis Obispo, California. Let's roll it. Students often wonder, why am I learning this? How is this going to add value to my future? I think design transfers into any industry. Everywhere you look, you'll see something that couldn't have been made without past generations being taught about design. When I started using Figma in the classroom, students were amazed by seeing all these cursors flying around. My students, at even the age of 12 years old, can be using this design software that folks are using in industry. I like being creative, and I don't get to do that in most of my classes. And it's really fun to like escape. Oh, what if I did this or messed with that? Students who maybe once saw themselves as just participants in a classroom, now becoming leaders in projects. You can bounce ideas off each other really easily. I'm able to make something that's a lot better than what I would have been able to make on my own. I've really seen a sense of community and connection built around Figma. It's a common place of acceptance. It's a really safe space to be in because we always make it a safe space. We just 
build bonds that are really strong. Figma is an amazing space and spot to help champion them and empower them to see the incredible humans that they are. These students are incredible. As are the educators who are exposing them to the magic of designing and building from such an early age. And I'm pretty sure this next generation of makers is truly going to have a profound impact on our industry and the world. All right, so that's it for our opening session of Config 2023. And now it's time for all of us to go be students. So for the next few hours, we have dozens of breakouts for you to check out an incredible ecosystem gallery, a live Fig Jam wall, an in-person research tank, lunch, and of course, a swag store so you can get all the latest Figma merch. So check it all out. Then we're going to be back here on the main stage for our closing sessions. They will start at 4 PM with a fireside chat between Dylan and Brian Chesky of Airbnb, and a closing keynote from entrepreneur, thinker, and designer Holly Thorlison. The doors open at 3.30. Please come early to get seats. And before you go to the breakout sessions, I just want to say again, thank you for being here. It means so much to us. Thank you. I hope all of you spend time connecting with each other today, because that's the magic of config. Not just the talks and launches, but also the connections we make. Have a great day, everyone. And we will see you back here at 3.30.